This is BBC Radio London. And I'm Jason Solomon, sitting in for Robert Elms with our new jingles. Uh, we're going to talk about The Cure with Ian Gittings. He's got a new book out, uh, Charting the Career of The Cure. So if uh, teenage mascara was all your thing and big hair uh, and sort of teenage misery and Camusian musings in pop uh, is your thing, you've got to stay tuned for us with The Cure. Uh, that's her new single, Love Is You. She's in concert at the Royal Festival Hall in October. Someone, uh, you, some, I think I've seen them at the Royal Festival Hall. Am I going mad? I think I have seen them at the Royal Festival. The Cure. I'm, t- I'm sure they played the Royal they Festival. Play they have played there. Ian Gittins would know this because he's just written a new book about the Cure and their career. It's called, oh, it's very heavy. It's called A Perfect Dream, and I'm slapping it up here. Um, Ian, congratulations on that. They have played the Thank Royal you. Festival. And, of course, uh, Robert Smith curated Meltdown. He did. Uh, only recently. I think it was the, this this year yeah. he curated Meltdown, which was a bit odd for Robert, I thought, because he he's not really a sort of public-facing sort of chap. He also doesn't do very much nowadays. They haven't, they haven't made a record in 10 years. They play festivals maybe every second summer. They just clean up and do a little lucrative festival tour. But he's not an active person nowadays. Why The Cure for you? Why? Well, when I was young, I loved them. Um, I've grown up with The Cure. I'm the same generation. I'm the same age as them. And they're the kind of band that when you're 18, 19, they mean everything. Yeah. You know, they're, they're bleeding for you. That they're, they're living your life. That They know what's going inside your head. As you get older, this, you know, you seem a bit silly sometimes <laughs> you think you put away childish things you put away all that angst i think that the that the memory's still there there's still a fondness towards them still an affection um but we go back we go back you know 40 years pretty much i suppose yeah i mean you've interviewed them over the years as well yeah, yeah. were you following as a music journalist you were, were you following them around among obviously I was, you're, you're, you were doing everyone who was around you know you didn't specialize in one band but did you go on the road with them what was your relationship with them? i went i interviewed them a couple of times the best time i went down to jane seymour's mansion in bath the actress jane seymour's got this huge kind of palatial place down in Bath uh, with a recording studio and she she sometimes um, uh, hires it out to bands and musicians and The Cure just took residence there for about a month while they made one of their albums in the in the mid-90s. No one had an evening with them down there. Uh, Robert Smith, to my amazement, is very intense talking about The Cure because there's a time, although The Cure's music is intense, when they're doing interviews, he was sort of laughing and joking, talking about football, talking about getting drunk. But when you get him on the good mood, he, he talks about The Cure in a very sort of... Um, intense and reflective fashion so Robert Smith in a good mood that exists it exists very much so (laughs) right because I mean so how much was it a public persona the kind of mascara the kind of misery the the, 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 killing an Arab the the, the Baudelarian side of them Mm. how much of that was a sort of art school front I think when it started he meant it he he meant it man you know that that was how he was he was a very kind of awkward teenager very sort of introspective um as you go through life, I mean, he said himself once or twice that, you know, you can't be 30 years old pretending that the world is against you and that nobody understands you. You look a bit silly, you know? Uh, and I guess after a while he slipped into the comfort zone, as most bands do. If, if, they, if they, you go and you do what you do, don't you? You go, you go and doing what you do. And that's yeah. what the cure did, I but, guess. Well, but the thing with the cure and looking through your book is that they, yes, they do what they do, but they sort of changed when they do what they did and then suddenly maybe the world changed around them because, mm. they, you know, they seem like a sort of quite a sort of almost, you know, post-punk band playing yeah. to small, small, you know, sweaty rooms here in London. And then suddenly they mm. make, they break America and they're playing stadium. Well, the strange thing was they're making these incredibly dark albums like Pornography, so made in 1982. Uh, and and they, they absolutely were a cult band. You know, the, the, the people who loved them, people who liked them loved them, but they weren't particularly wide, had no particularly wide audience. Uh, then suddenly he started writing pop songs, really brilliant pop songs like Why Can't I Be You and The Love Cats. Uh, and being Robert Smith, he then started slagging them off. He said, that's not really a cure song. You know, I, I don't want to be in the pop So charts. you sort of kind of uh, head off the criticism in, in, in advance because people say, you're selling out. Hard cure, cure fans would be saying, you're selling out. And then Robert Smith was going, yeah, I'm, I'm selling out. He seemed to feel oddly ashamed of writing pop songs with melodies and tunes which is a shame because that's that's the side of the cure that I like the most I've always liked the upbeat side I like this one In Between Days The Cure one of the tracks that helped them break America, I think. Nineteen eighty, I think nineteen eighty-five. Ian Gittins would know. He's written a book, a perfect, perfect dream, which chronicles all of their hits and goes into great detail about how they were made and when they came out. Uh, that that track seemed to me quite poppy of them, but yet yeah, still ha- has the essence of the Cure in it. The kind of mis- it's got a sort of ache in there. Yes, I think aches a very good word for the Cure. It's sort of kind of yearning at the heart of the heart of what they do. 
Were they always called? They weren't always called the cure, were they? Because I always thought they, they, they what the cure meant. You know, it had some mm. medicinal sort of properties to it, or, or they, they needed a cure. A lot of them, the way they looked, <laughs> all pasty. Yeah, they had a few names. It started off as the obelisk, and then they became malice in the punk years. And they got the name the cure because um, Robert Smith was going reading a lot of William Burroughs, and he liked the whole cut up theory of literature. Um, so all the band members put a, a, a few words from a cure song into into a hat. And they drew out the piece of paper and it said Easy Cure, which is a song that Lol Tolhurst, the, the drummer at the time, was writing. So they became Easy Cure for a few months and then they then switched to the cure and went on from there. Easy Cure sounds like something you get in boots. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <Isn't> it, <yeah. laughs> so I'm glad, got, I'm glad they went with the cure. Uh, where, t- tell us about people might not know this. Where, where are the cure from? What's their kind of makeup? How they start, you mentioned Lol there. What, what was their original makeup and where do they get together? And where's Robert that, Smith from? Home counties from Crawley, from Sussex, which they've always railed against. They've always talked about, oh, it's so boring, man. That, I mean, part of the whole shtick was rebelling well, against That's them. presumably why they got out. Hmm? That's probably presumably why you form a band, to get out of Crawley. It's a big motivation, isn't it, to get out of the small towns? Yeah, it's very true. And so that's where they met, and they were all together. And they, it was a, it was an art school thing, wasn't it? They were all it wasn't really art school. Um, they met in school, right? They met in, in the sixth the form, pretty school. much. Yeah, and then they in the, in the sixth form they became quite active. But no, but by the time Smith was nineteen, they were making records and starting to have hits. So he never went to university. He never went to art school, oddly enough. And even though they, quote, you know, "Killing an Arab" was their first singles, which quotes uh, Albert Camus, Camus yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, which is now I think it's now on the now on the London stage. I know it was one of my favourite books. Obviously, when you when mm. you when you read it, I think I did it for French yeah. A level. So was, obviously that's the, the, the time that you get it. But there's also Baudelaire in there, and as you mentioned, William Burroughs, literary Dante. Rossetti, they use some of the, the quotes from very literary source mm. for their for their for their lyrics. They're quite bookish. They always have been. Yeah. And were they? I mean, were they reading books, or they just kind of get the quotes from it? Is, is it? Is, is there an actual sort of depth to Robert Smith there, or is it a kind of pose? I think when he's seventeen, eighteen, there's a lot of um, a lot of reading classic books in in long overcoats going on. Um, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of being in his bedroom, thinking this is the real stuff of life. You know, better than bloody Crawley. <laughs> <laughs> Anything is. Um, when you look at the pictures in your book as well, which is one of the one of the the joys of such a book as well. You look at all their backstage photos and yeah. them posing as well, and then sort of finding their look, if you like, which I, I think with The Cure is one of those key looks, mm. you know, of, of British pop. It, it took them a while. Robert Smith at, with short hair is it's a bit odd to see Robert Smith sort of smart and short hair without mascara. Well, bizarrely, their manager, Chris Parry, um, used, to, used to sort of complain they had no image. They had nothing that they unrecognisable. They'd turn up in cricket sweaters and, and, and comfortable slacks. They used to look <laughs> dreadful, really, you know. In fact, to the extent that um, their debut album, he the, 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 cover, the cover picture was uh, a fridge and a lot it's just household appliances and I picture the band at all which Smith hated because he didn't know this was going to happen he was presented with it as a fait accompli um, but the image yeah the image actually came later and the, the main thing was the hair starting to kind of back home the, the sort of precipitous amount of hair they got so was it did they Did they, how, how did it happen Did it, was there a day where they went oh I'll, I'll leave it like this or you know I've, I've just been through the wind and, I'm, and it's going to stay <laughs> like that but I mean it's a lot of gel going on there's a time with gel you know you need a gel, gel you don't yeah. get a lot much gel anymore well also of course it wasn't just them I mean the Tucci and the Banshees at the time Bauhaus a lot of bands were going for they that they were quite work. close to Susie and the Banshees Robert they? Smith played with them for yeah he played on a couple of albums and, and Natalie was in the band for, for a while so that, that, that they, they kind of worked that look together and the mascara I suppose it was it's, it's slightly new romantic but yeah. you know Flock of Seagulls and Spandau and all but it, it, it's more miserable it's not as colourful as those like, new romantics weren't miserable no it was it was black and white new romantics wasn't it yeah I suppose yes I suppose it was the new wave of new romantics the, the French new wave of new romantic the Camus to their <laughs> whatever their, their, yeah. their whatever I don't know a, a, a poppy philosopher that the new romantics could be mm. compared to when you go back and do a book about the cure you know you, and obviously photographs are going to be a huge sort of mm. element of this do they um, you know going over the memories for, of them does that spark memories of you because obviously as you say you grew up with them as your career as well at the same time well, it does. Do you? I, mean, I was at university in the early 80s and I, I didn't base my luck on Robert Smith it wasn't that dissimilar you know it was second hand Long great coats from charity shops it was uh, I was more like a Billy Idol kind of look really sort of peroxide hair sort are of you peroxide did you yeah, yeah. interesting yeah. Yeah, they used to, they've still got sort of you know greyish highlights. You have a similar colour to me. Yeah, they're, but... they're more natural. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> we, the, um, the the cure. What, what do they mean to people now? I've like said well, I'm talking about the cure today. You know, people in the office think, oh, I love the cure. You know, because mm. it takes them back to a certain time. Yeah. Is there a, is there a risk with a band like this that you know you, you, you they only belong to a certain time, or can we still listen to them now? I mean, in between days, just now sounded great. Do we still listen to the cure, I think or do we want to hear new stuff from them? I don't. Well, know. it's really their fault if they're seen as a heritage. I haven't made a record in ten years. Right. Um, every, every two so I have much choice but to listen to the old stuff. Oh, well, exactly. Yeah. I think to be honest, nowadays Robert Smith is he's quite lazy. Um, he goes out and tour every two, three years. He does, a, you know, cleans up. He gets paid a fortune for headlining festivals. He'll occasionally do an interview and talk about making a new. He said he's making a record next year. 
if we'll see it, who knows? You know, you said, you said this before and it's never happened. Because his meltdown was strangely curated, I thought. Mm. Um, it, I mean, it was obviously, but it was very, it was very white. It was very kind of male as well. Yeah. It took him a long time to find some sort of, I complained about it initially because it was very white and very male. And I thought, well, come on, meltdown and Southwick should mm. reflect a little bit more, I thought. And then they did sort of manage to find some female-led bands in there. Yeah. Were, they, were, were they a very blokish kind of outfit altogether? I mean, there's a lot of alcoholism and, and, and drugs abuse in, in the book, but they didn't seem like, like massively blokey rock and roll lot. I don't know them. You knew, you knew them more than I did. They were quite blokey. Yeah, um, right. they, they like to drink. They like talking about football. Um, yeah, who do they support? Who do they support? That's a good question. Robert Smith. Who did he support? Was it Brighton? I can't remember there. Well, from there, from Crawley, you could I Brighton or Crystal Palace? It seems to me. Yeah. Where, you're, where, you're lo- where your allegiance is like? Where's I can't Robert remember. You were talking about England. He was a big England fan, right? Uh, when I was, I was a melody maker in the in the late eighties, and we did a front cover with of him and his England in, England kit. Um, heading of football, right? Which lot- England kit was that? Late, so it would have been the, uh, the Umbro, world- I think. Umbro. <laughs> Classic Umbro, <laughs> which a lot of um, Cure fans hated because for them, Robert Smith is all about angst and introspection and desolation, not about talking about football. Not about football, not I about, know. And also, it wasn't an intellectual pursuit in the eighties. Football, no. really. You know? I'm not sure it is now. <laughs> it certainly is. Of course, there's all French people talking about football. They were they're the world champions now. They weren't back then. Oh, that's true. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, so there was a bit of a footballness in, in there as well. And mm. what about when touring happened for them? It seemed, you know, it's, it, it did. Did seem even at the time to find mm. them being such a sort of headline band and being sort of pop stars and being on top of the pops. And I think in the book he talks about we were on top of the pops and we didn't really we hated it. Yeah, didn't want to go on. Yeah, well on tour they they drank huge amounts and they took a massive amount of drugs. They, they were basically Aerosmith. They're basically a, a backcombed Aerosmith on on tour, um, <laughs> which caused a lot of tensions between them. Well, oh, Lol Tolhurst the the drummer who became the keyboardist, um, basically he was an alcoholic for, for years and years and until he got kicked out of the band. And then, as you know, sued them in the 90s um, in quite a sort of, you know, quite an unpleasant court case that went on. Yeah, so they were one of the most, one of the famous kind of first court cases, weren't they? That's, yeah. that's chronicled in the book as well. They were, it was really acrimonious, the split. It was deeply What was it about? Well, they kicked Tolhurst out because the drinking, he, he confessed it himself. He's written his own book and confessed that he was just useless by then. He couldn't do anything. He couldn't play anything. He couldn't do anything. You know, he wasn't contributing to the, to the band at all. Uh, they kicked him out, uh, which he had first quite meekly accepted. But then, about two, three years later, he decided that, hey, he wasn't having this. And he saw he went to see a lawyer who advised him that um, he could be getting more royalties from them than he was. Um, so basically, he sued them for a larger share of the royalties. And, um, and, and and also, over the band name, he wanted to use the band. He said they couldn't use the name anymore without him because he was a founder member. Um, he lost the case fairly resoundingly because, unfortunately, all the dirty washing came out in court and, and Smith and Simon Gallup uh, told stories about how useless Tolhurst was, yeah. how they used to have to put... I can little... imagine from the look of them, there was quite a lot of dirty washing, quite <laughs> smelly as well. <laughs> quite fancy, though, I thought. <laughs> um, how, how, he apparently used to put little... Um, Little coloured dots on the keyboards. So they, they just put them on so Tolhurst knew his key to fess. He was so far gone. Um, yeah, it's it quite a, quite unpleasant story, really. Tolhurst. Actually, nobody came out of it very well because Tolhurst was obviously a raging drunk for years, uh, and the Cure were bullies. The Cure bullied him. Bullied him. I, I talked to him, in the book. I talked to Boris Williams, who was the drummer in the Cure for ten years, and he, he's quite candid about how badly they treated Tolhurst. How they used to play practical jokes. They used to ridicule him. He said, he said that they never quite beat him up, but he's getting quite close to that. He said, you know, mm. and, and, that, and that bullying aspect came out in the in the court case. As well. Some people never leave the school no, playground, exactly. do they? <laughs> it's like... that theory that when the, the, the age you get famous, that you stay that age mentally, and the cure got famous at eighteen. Mm. So yeah, and I suppose they they were. I mean, look, I, some of the songs are, are brilliant still, and they sound great, and they, they're, they're sonically good. But I think there's a sort of mood to them as well, which is very mm. well captured in your book, A Perfect Dream. Ian Gittins, congratulations on thank that, you. and thank you very much for coming to talk to us on BBC Radio London about the Cure. I think people like the Cure, so we're going to hear some more of them. Oh, there's a pop from The Cure. I hope they're better now. That's uh, Robert Smith and The Cure. Uh, Ian Gittins was my guest. His book is A Perfect Dream. It's out now. It's a, a picture book and uh, you know, writing and sort of very interesting playlist as well that kind of sums up the, uh, the Cure and uh, their vibe for you here.